things that we discovered back in 2014, funded by the National Brain Tumor Society, was a very shocking observation, which was that um, the gene that's most commonly amplified or driving glioblastoma, this EGF receptor, um, is amplified almost entirely on extrachromosomal DNA. That what had actually been known for a few years, but what was not known and what was a complete shock was that, in fact, when cells from patients, or actually when patients themselves were treated with EGF receptor inhibitors, the tumors became resistant to the drug as this DNA disappeared from the extrachromosomal elements. And when the drug was removed, it reappeared and made the tumors both more aggressive, but once again, sensitive. So this is really quite remarkable. And when we published this in Science in 2014, I think people had difficulty really understanding what does this mean, or why is this important, or is this just a strange phenomenon of a, of a particularly aggressive cancer. I realized that there was a hole in the field. And so we set out to actually ask not only what's amplified in cancer, but where is it, and does it matter? And what we found was quite shocking that half of cancers, including the overwhelming majority of brain cancers, particularly glioblastoma, have driver oncogenes amplified on extrachromosomal DNA. And that, in fact, it matters a great deal because it is, for some very fascinating reasons having to do with how these genes were inherited from mother cell to daughter cell, the property of being on these extracellular chromosomal, these extrachromosomal DNA particles allows the tumors to evolve at light speed. And that's one of the reasons that these tumors become so aggressive and, uh, and so resistant to drugs so rapidly. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally what this does is this is an, a set of findings that actually completely shifts our map of cancer. That is, we knew some of the pieces, but amazingly, they were in the wrong locations. And the, and the, the location actually turns out to matter a great deal. So now we're in a, a period where I think the map is quite fundamentally changing, and we're beginning to try to grasp what does this actually mean, and what does this mean for patients? Well, I think it means a number of things. First of all, it explains why these tumors seem to come out of nowhere, um, and why, you know, it, most patients don't have the benefit of an early detection. They don't have the benefit of saying, well, we caught it early so we can prevent it or we can prevent it from getting worse. It's as if the patient is healthy one day and the next thing they have this very aggressive cancer. This is a mechanism that in fact explains that behavior. The second aspect of it is what does this mean for treating patients? So one possibility is the data on the behavior of these driver oncogenes and extrachromosomal DNAs suggests that we might be, need to begin to treat with very, very different dosing schedules. And that's something there is scientific evidence to suggest a rationale for doing it. And that's something that needs to be tested actively in the clinic. A third area under very active investigation is what are the mechanisms that allow the genes to drop to, to effectively jump off chromosomes? Because, in fact, those mechanisms may be absolutely critical both for the formation and the progression of glioblastomas. And if we can figure out how to target that process, this may have a very big impact in either reducing the development or progression of the disease and may form a next generation set of treatments. Lastly, as we begin to think about glioblastoma as a disease that's evolving rapidly, um, we do have examples of diseases that evolve rapidly that we can treat. That's what bacterial infections do. And understanding that allows us to put together either combinations of therapy or to change the way that those cells behave in such a way that we can actually treat them. Well, in fact, there may be very salient analogies here for cancers of the brain. And trying to understand that process and figuring out what are the vulnerabilities that are actually entailed by this very rapid evolutionary process it might lead to the next generation of therapies. So I think what we have here is something that's very fundamentally relevant. And by the way, it turns out that part of the Defeat GBM consortium, uh, or the Defeat GBM program, um, Rel Verhoek, uh, quite independently of us, found exactly the same phenomenon in glioblastoma. So this is extremely important because it's an independent validation of the work. And it suggests that what we've seen here is both quite robust and fundamental and reproducible. And thrills me, uh, and in fact I think is a, a real success story for the Defeat GM program of the National Brain Tumor Society. Well, I think 
one of the things that's been quite terrific for me uh, to be a part of this Defeat GBM program is that there's a structure and a set of, of collaborative arrangements in place that allow us to go from discovery potentially to things that we can actually do about it in the clinic. So let's start on the discovery side. It was at a meeting in Phoenix a year and a half ago where I sat down with Dr. Gerhawk uh, and said, I've been working on something. I have a feeling you may find this interesting. And I showed him the data and lo and behold, he pulled out his and we looked at each other in shock because there we were, we found this. So we began to compare notes and talk about it and help each other you know, think through what it was that we were seeing. And of course, in science, independent validation is the best thing that can possibly happen in a field. Um, and in addition, the other cores and the other program, the other components of the Defeat GBM uh, program allow us a set of interactions with colleagues, including the potential to actually test drugs in patient samples that might be able to address or stop this process. So it's been a really extraordinary and interactive um, program, and, uh, and I think way ahead in its thinking about how science needs to be done in order to make a difference for patients. I believe in the scientific process. I believe that that's actually what's going to make a difference in patients' lives. And one of the reasons that the scientific process is often slow in turning knowledge into outcomes for patients is because the ecosystem of science is a complicated one. And it's very hard to be able to have the pieces in place to interact rapidly. The Defeat GBM program is almost like an like a catalyst. It puts together the pieces that allow progress to move much more quickly. And so it's been a thrill to be a part of it. And I and you know, I really congratulate the National Brain Tumor Society for being so forward thinking in developing this program. To just give you an example, right, I, I'm in touch with Dr. Clausey on an almost daily basis, or at least twice or three times a week. And you know, that interaction very much shapes what we do in the lab, and I hope and I think it shapes what he does in the clinic. Similarly with Dr. Mellinghoff, it is a nonstop series of emails, calls, discussions about where to go next. And, and, and our, our group has broadened, so I have emails in my box uh, right now from Dr. DeGroot. We're, go we're going back and forth, for example, on um, particular combinations of therapies. I'll just give an example. So we had, we had found a vulnerability in GVM cells that one might be able to take advantage of by combining two drugs. And again, quite independently, in, in his screen uh, with Eric Solman, they found exactly the same vulnerability. And so they're working, it's again, beautiful example of independent validation of data, lens confidence, and now they're trying to develop a compendium of drugs that you might be able to use to move forward with it. This is really a key aspect of agency that the National Brain Tumor Society is doing to empower us as scientists and as clinicians to, 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 try, to try to make a difference. We actually want everybody to try to take risks and try to find out things that are new, right? And we also want to balance that with checks that allow us to say, hey, what you found is really real because they found it too. That's exactly what's happening in the Defeat GBM program of the National Brain Tumor Society. I mean, these are two very clear examples of it. So I'm thrilled to be a part of it because I think it allows us both to take risks and do something new and to have the opportunity of independent validation of our findings. So I think there's two areas. One of them is very fundamental, which is what role does this process of, of uh, extrachromosomal DNA formation uh, have in the development and progression of cancer? What causes it? How does it change how oncogenes are expressed? What does it actually do in, uh, in terms of outcome to patients? How is it that it helps the cancers evolve so rapidly? Can we find vulnerabilities that can be targeted? Can we identify new ways to treat cancer based upon this new fundamental understanding of a critical process in the development and progression of cancer. A second area that's tightly linked to that is it makes us begin to think about new ways of treating cancer that try to identify vulnerabilities that are entailed by these rapidly evolving tumors. And those can be vulnerabilities that are shaped not only by the driver oncogenes that are on these extra chromosomal 
DNA elements, but also literally by the microenvironment of the brain. The brain is a very unique biochemical place. And in fact, the way that cancer cells use very fundamental ingredients to grow may be shaped both by the mutations and amplifications and by the brain itself, creating a whole new set of vulnerabilities that might be targeted with drugs that we have not traditionally part of cancer pipelines, but drugs that may be much more effective, much more bioavailable to the brain, and lead to a whole new pharmacopoeia for cancer patients. The other aspect of it that's maybe a little bit more distant, but it's certainly very much in my mind, is that this begins to get at maybe a fundamental place where the environment interacts with the genome. You know, the dance that all of us talk about but have trouble dissecting, you know, which is how does the environment interact with genes, including mutated and amplified genes, to cause cancer or the progression of cancer or to influence how patients who have cancer do, ultimately leading to a point where I hope we can come to empower patients by giving them information about what can you can do to, to lower your risk, or if you have cancer, what can you do to increase the likelihood that you're going to thrive? You know, These are all things that I think are going to be very important and areas for future work. 